Welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Back, and we played musical chairs here. We <laughs> now have Gary Emineth, who is a former GOP chairman um, yeah. in North Dakota. We asked him on because he is involved in politics, kind of a, you're also an entrepreneur in your other life, right? Yeah, <laughs> m most of it, yeah. Oh, always up to something, but very involved in politics. And we're interested in your take and what's going on with the Republican Party right now in the state. Well, part of the issue with the Republican Party in North Dakota is they've, they've kind of closed in on themselves. They've, they, you know, a, a political party is protected under the First Amendment to gather around beliefs that they have and the, the federal government protects in Constitution Amendment number one. And what's happened is they've used that really to um, circle the wagons, if you will, is what I would really say they're doing and doing policy changes within the party, not through the legislature, through the party to protect the politicians and protect their own incumbency. And the redistricting even kicks some of that off, which is really unfortunate. And, and um, so some people have said I've been a little hard on my Republican friends, but I really want them to stay in the majority, and I'm really there to try to encourage them to, to give up some of their foolish thinking that some of the policies they're passing. So. And so I assume you're referring to the December 18th meeting. There were some things that went on there as far as policy. And I always wondered, was there a reason that that business had to be done before the end of the year and before the new district chairs were seated, that were elected? Or could, that, could those decisions have waited until after all the redistricting meetings had happened in the districts or the, you know, to, to get their new chairmen elected by the people of that district? And what you're really speaking to is there was a state committee meeting where they have, you know, maybe meetings three to four times a year. And coming out of redistricting, there was an appointment of eight chairmen, I think maybe eight or ten by the chairman, by the state chairman. And they were pushing some really crazy policies, in my opinion. One of them was pay to play. So mm -hmm. they're really asking someone who runs for the U.S. Senate or Congress that they should have to pay a fee of $5,000 and for statewide office, $2,500. And that's, that's silly. I mean, there's years when I was involved previously where we had a very difficult time um, even getting candidates. And for them to fund their own campaign and then write a check out to the party for $5,000 is foolish. Second thing is they've made it more difficult for someone to get on the convention floor to actually to be endorsed. You have to get signatures. They wanted to get as, there's 47 districts. And so the state committee, the Republican Party, just to kind of give you a little background, is made up of about 60 people. And... They're passing policies, uh, those 60, and that what you're referring to is eight of them were put in place by the chairman through redistricting. And there was some major policy decisions. They should have waited until the districts, the other eight or so, elected people from their district so they could confirm that they would, you know, have policies that the people would really want. So in their instance, the, um, the fee was, ex was a deal. They wanted to have 20 signatures from 47 districts. To be, on, yeah. to be able to speak, it used to be five or six. And the other thing is that the meeting was actually closed. Um, a number of us former state chairmen wanted to speak to the group because we saw these were radical changes, including um, former Governor Ed Schaefer. They said the meeting's closed. They had security. They closed the meeting up to not allowing people in. They brought in a national parliamentarian. And the reason you would do that is to control the debate and the discussion at a meeting, yes. the shutdown discussion. And that's really what's happening. Republicans are kind of circling the wagon and charging these fees. They're really making it more difficult to be involved rather than, um, you know, it's always about the grassroots and all the people being a part of it. And when you have a state committee of 60 people making radical changes and some of them not even fully elected from their district to your point of those eight people, that could have waited easily another month or two months. Um, and so those are the kind of things that I'm frustrated with that's happening to the Republican Party to why would you have closed meetings? Why do you not let people in? We even invited the media to come into our meetings. I mean, when I was chairman. And so we, we think it's important to involve people, let the word out, have more transparency. I mean, there's times there's strategic meetings, you gotta be closed, but meetings like this were, were, are not like that. And so I'm frustrated by that. Oh, well, I'm concerned because it really puts people off. And I'm not as acquainted with politics. You know, I write my letters all the time yeah. and every once in a while I'll show up to testify. But I feel like, wow, how unwelcoming. And I'm wondering, are other states doing anything similar to this, especially the fees? It, did they just come up with this on their own, or are there other states that do this? You know, the, the fee, my opinion of the fees and the signatures is really to restrict 
certain people and make it difficult for what I would say maybe be fringe people that we the Republican Party has a history of pretty much making it easy for anyone to be a candidate to try to get endorsement and so when you go to the convention you have um, somebody who's going to get about 20 minutes of stage time in front of 2,000 people and they and somebody can be very not very complimentary to who they're running against so they're afraid that somebody's going to say something negative against the other candidate and and the reality is politics is rough and tumble business you know and and um, the idea of trying to restrict that debate and constrict what's going on in policy discussions, one of the other things they've done is the, the platform, is, which is why you're a party member, why you join, what's your philosophy, why you're involved. There used to be like 47 members on the, on the committee. They've winnowed it down to 10 now through this same meeting. And I'm going, why would you restrict more input and to go to 10 and the resolutions. We used to have maybe 50 or 60 resolutions for what you support as a party. Now they're saying you can only have 15. And it's really, to me, it's like they're wanting the Republican Party to be like the Eagles or the Elks or Coca-Cola or some brand as opposed to why we come together as partisans, why we're involved in being um, in, in the process. It's not to go to dinners. It's really, yeah, that's part of it but and socialize, but it's really about what I believe. And I think that's what got the Democrats in trouble and why they're in such a minority because they moved their policies so far to the left and many of them have now joined Republicans and become into that policy so we've become more liberal as a party. Right. So, so you've so got um, Democrats over here that are disenfranchised at their own party and they want to join <laughs> join the rest of the happy people so to speak and they come in and the Republican Party has basically been pretty welcoming. Yes. And that's, like you said, what has moved the fulcrum on the teeter-totter mm -hmm. here. And we have become a little bit more liberal as a party. But when we try to hold those responsible to the platform that they set up, they're saying that they don't have to. It's just a suggestion. And now they've come up with new resolutions and rules that make it sound like you know, if you're the naughty kid in class, we want everybody to tell on you and go to the chairman and say, tisk tisk, they are saying things or doing things that we didn't authorize. What's your take on that? Uh, this code, they've come up with a code of conduct which is horrible. Yeah. It is absolutely horrible. And the worst part about that is that they have um, on the code of conduct that if anybody on the state committee doesn't fall in line that you're supposed to call the state chairman or the executive director and report in. Now, that's not the country I grew up in or that I'm, that I was really not that interested in being involved anymore. I'm back building my company, so I'm kind of <laughs> like, I've kind of moved on in politics. I'm involved, etc. But this has gotten me so riled up, I can't hardly stop talking about it. And I think it's just ludicrous that we have a code of conduct and we're going to be reporting on it's like tattletaling back when you had a hall monitor in elementary yes, school. Yes, I'm going to call the chairman gosh. and say, hey, did you hear what so-and-so said? I mean, this is politics. I mean, we go back to founding fathers and read what Jefferson and John Adams. and that, right. Those were tough times working through no a lot of doubt. issues. And that's what's going on in this country. And, you know, we go back to the face, man, the face mask and the mandates. And it's got a lot of people wound up. And why, you know, if we take a contrary position to what the party wants or leadership, and then somebody's going to tattle, what, what have we become as a country, as a state, as a society that we can't even disagree? And, and back to the platform of, of having 10 members versus 47 and having 15 resolutions, they want to winnow that down so that we don't offend anybody so we can get 100% of the vote. And I'm, I, I'm not interested in a party that's like that because I have values. I'm a pro-lifer. You know, I believe what marriage represents certain things, and so I'm going to fight for some of those values in the Second, um, second Amendment. I mean, if you go back to the Democrat Party, you know, they used to be made up of a lot of Catholics, and Democrats got abortion wrong. And consequently, many of those Catholics have become Republicans, and that's built our base <laughs> yeah. into a big number, consequently. Yes. And, um, and so what happens is if you're in a swing district or moderate district, uh, someone that's kind of like, I'm not sure what I believe, but I like to be a politician or a legislator or whatever, they run for office. Well, let's be a Republican so I can get elected. We don't spend time talking to them. Well, what do you really believe? Should you be, uh, you know with us or are you with the Democrats? And so those are issues that, that I believe are important with, when it comes to resolution and platform and encouraging us to have robust debate.
Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. it's, they're trying to squash that, and that's just wrong. It's right. wrong and business. And we, we see movement from party to party over time. I'm going to hand the mic over to Carmen and Jan, because they were at a grassroots uh, workshop last weekend. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Well, it was a two-day event, and it was the same information both days, so people had a choice of which day to come. We had a group of six um, local senators and representatives that came and gave us information. Um, basically, on the whole political process, they explained what happens in the Republican Party from the time that you attend your district reorganizational meeting all the way up to being elected for an office. And they gave, um, they kind of empowered everybody with enough information that if they so would choose to serve, here's how you go about it, here's how you get involved. Unfortunately, we've had more feedback that was not as positive as you would think it was. We had nearly 150 attendees in those two days, and the people were excited. They were super excited to find out the information. They got to talk one-on-one -on -one with their representatives and learn things that were happening in different districts and what they could do in their part of the world to make a difference in the state. But like I said, when we heard back from some of the powers that be in the Republican Party, they were not as excited or inclusive of those folks. It's as though they do not want grassroots movement in the state. They don't want to grow the party. They just want your money and for you to... Sorry, I was going to say shut up, but be quiet and go home. Mm -hmm. Pick up your ball and go home. Yes, yep. pretty much. Yep, we know everything and you're just there to give us money and vote. It's, it's really that's crazy. That's the feeling that the grassroots gets. And I wish yes. that the powers that be would understand that when you feel like you have no voice, things go a little wonky. Differently, yes. You know? And so if you're not willing to listen to the constituents that elected you, whether it's a district chair, whether it's a state party chair, whether it's a legislator, whether mm -hmm. if you don't listen to who voted you in, what does that tell the people who voted you in, uh, it, if you have no voice? That's, that's a big rub for me. Um, well, then you're easy pickings, because you'll go where you will be listened to, right? Well, well and, but where are you going to go? And so well, are we talking yeah. a third talking party? about fringe are people we, leaving, because some people are just like, well, I'm not going there, you know. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that, that gets into that voting for lesser of two evils thing, and we don't want to do that. I right. mean, North Dakota right. has a super majority, man. Seven Republicans to every um, single person that's of another party will say, the Democrats right now are basically politically irrelevant. So if something's going right in this state, it's due to the Republicans. And if something's going wrong, it's due to the Republicans. Mm -hmm. How do we change yeah. that? Well, you know, what do you think? When I, when I was chairman, we, um, I took, it was back in 2007 to 10, so it gives you an idea of the window. But in 2008, Barack Obama got elected president, and the Tea Party sprung out of it. And Tea Party stood for tax enough already, and it was a big movement, and Republicans were very threatened by that. And as I was chairman, I was very careful about going to Tea Party events because they didn't want partisan people there. And after I served my time as chairman, um, I um, met with a number of the Tea Party people when I was chairman, but after I was no longer chairman, and I talked to them. I said, why? I, I, they wanted to do some workshops around the state, like what you just attended, and I participated in some of them. And I'd always start out and I'd say, how many of you are um, conservatives in the room? How many of you are liberals? How many are you libertarians? And I'd say Republicans and Democrats. Well, they were all conservative Republicans. And so I went back to my Republican friends and I'd say, why are you afraid of, these are our people. They go, they maybe go to the Capitol, they open up with prayer, they talk about the Constitution yes. and America and on and on and on. And when they leave, they clean up after themselves. They take their chairs with them and their flags and the pastor that say the opening prayer. And it, there was a great event. I said, these are our people. And they'd say, oh, man, they're going to try to take over the party. And I'd say, well, no, we should embrace these people. And that's the grassroots. And that's just what's going on now. It's just 10 years later. And Republicans have become more in power and more yes. in control. And now you have the establishment, if you will, and some people say, who's that, what's that? Well, they know who they are. But what they're really doing is they're trying to build walls to protect their incumbency, which is why there's a frustration from people to say, let's go do term limits. And so we have a, an initiative underway, and I suspect it will pass. And, and I, I'm kind of mixed bag on whether, whether support term limits, because I think every two or four years you have a term limit opportunity to beat someone. But to be honest, I signed a petition a couple days ago because I'm saying, 
our elected officials need to get a message. They need to understand that we've had enough and we're spending too much money um, and we are embracing values that aren't the, most of the people of North Dakota, which is why you have a, a workshop of people propping up out of nowhere, if you will. Mm -hmm. 150 people show up. The Republican Party should have been at that event recruiting everyone and saying, you need to be a part of what we're doing, not squashing it. They should be supporting that because yes. these are all, I, can, I, I would guess, Jan, that you would say most of them were conservatives at that group. Oh, meeting. yes, absolutely. And so there's the Republicans. So why should Republicans be, you know, people are getting in, educated, trained up to how to be involved, and they're threatened by that. So that tells right. you everything you need to know. Right. When they push back and they're threatened, that's a problem. Well, and just to let you know, we did not vet anybody that came to this event. Anybody that was that wanted to register was welcomed. We did not, we had kind of a cutoff for a head count for the meal um, a couple days before, but we allowed walk-ins. You could pay at the door. I know that there were some people, the Southwest uh, District Chairman said he was not allowed to be there. I reached out to him for comment. Um, for the last couple of days, he hasn't returned my calls. Wow. Um, but he was overheard by a legislator saying that he was not allowed to attend the event, but he did not register. I was one of the organizers, he did not register. So, you know, they would have been welcome and they probably could have added to the whole event, but right. instead they criticized. Right. And so that's why I'm frustrated why I'm giving my Republican friends some grief because they're working towards minority status when, they, when, when we are in power and Republicans, and there's a lot of good people, most are great people, but there's people mm -hmm. that want to be in uh, positions of power or their ego or prestige, whatever goes with it, for the wrong reason to be in politics, if you ask me. But, but really, the, they, they ought to be embracing what's going on and encouraging it. And when you have meetings of talking about philosophy and the platform and around the state and bringing mm -hmm. people in, we're not going to all agree. My wife and I don't agree most of the, well, <laughs> let's say half the time, okay? <laughs> but the point is, in that process, we have discussions about it and we grow and we learn and my son who challenges old man over stuff sometimes i'm saying hey i'm learning i got to get i got to get with them you know and but the party should be doing the same thing it doesn't That's mean right. we compromise there's things that are really stakes in the ground that we don't move on am i pro life mm -hmm. what about the second amendment you know there's things that we're bound together on but there are things that we need to be flexible on right. and the party should not be pushing back from workshops like this and that's the problem closed meetings you know, security. I mean, this yeah. is ridiculous. And, well, and I'm embarrassed for my Republican right, leadership that right. are doing that. I want to go back to the training that we went to or the workshop because I remember when I first got involved, and it was back in those times when a certain president got elected, and I thought, yeah, we're done, you know. <laughs> right. But I, I mean, I really panicked and freaked out for a while, but that was just me. But the thing is, at this workshop, if you're ever wondering about getting involved, how do you, how do you navigate yes. the system? You hear redistricting, you hear this, you hear that, and there's all these acronyms and there's all these things mm -hmm. and it scares everybody. It's just like, oh, I'm not doing that. I might vote and that's about it. But these workshops, man, if you hear about one, they're so good because they dig into the hierarchy of how is it organized? How do you, you know, how can you fit? What, what can you do? What can't you do? What, you know, and there was just so much good information and it wasn't threatening by any means. It was just discussion and, and information. It's a great thing. The, the state party should be the ones doing these. Well, it was such great energy there and it just seems such a shame that uh, the leadership didn't want to attend yeah. and actually add to it. Mm -hmm. it. It's like they could have like mended things instead of burning well, bridges. Right. Knowledge and information like that empowers people. So right. people in position of power can get threatened by that yes. empowerment. So that's right. a little bit what's going on. There needs to be some settling, but I do think Republicans and grassroots need to keep the pressure on so they don't they quit making these foolish decisions to keep people away and and it's gonna shrink the party and hurt the party. And Republicans have everything going for them today. And mm -hmm. to 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 give that up would be very foolish. And that's part of the reason why I'm being hard on my Republicans and say, hey, change course because you're gonna give the Democrats an opportunity because yes. one of the has negatives of term limits, all those incumbents with many terms of serving are Republicans. And when an incumbent doesn't run, it's more likely to have a party flip. So the Democrats really have a better opportunity in this term limit because there are legislators who've been there 20, 30 years and now they're only going to get to be there for eight, maybe 16 if they run for House and Senate together. And so 
those seats and longevity that's by, by servant is going to be flipped and it's going to create opportunity. So.